Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the, uh, I don't know what number of this session this is, but this is the uh, HLSL and Vulcan uh, there and back again. That was uh, our working title, and it made it into the final thing. I uh, apologize if it's, if it's a little silly. Um, and there's been a lot of work done in the, uh, in the ecosystem recently um, uh, as far as HSL and Vulcan. And if you were at the SIGGRAPH Kronos event, um, it was just me up there talking about HSL and Vulcan, but I went and made some friends. Uh, and now they're going to present about HSL and Vulcan as well. Uh, and so what we're going to cover is uh, Spear V Opt, and then uh, Matthias is going to cover some uh, how to get from HSL to Vulcan. Um, and finally, There'll be a uh, deep fish dive on uh, DXC Spear Egg. And so uh, let's get started. Greg? Well, I'm Greg Fisher. I'm a, com a compiler engineer uh, at, uh, from Lunar G. And uh, we're going to talk today about uh, uh, using Spear V Opt uh, to shrink uh, your shaders and, uh, and legalize your shaders, uh, particularly HLSL shaders. Um, uh, when you uh, use them with Vulkan. So the, the goals of the talk are um, to answer the following questions here. What, what is Spear V Opt? Uh, and uh, what is the uh, status of Spear V size these days? What is, uh, what is HLSL legalization and uh, why should you be concerned about that, or why should uh, uh, Vulcan programmers with HLSL shaders be concerned about that? And finally, um, once you are concerned, how to use Spear Viopt um, to alleviate your concerns. All right, All right be, uh, before we talk about Spear Viopt, we should probably, uh, I'll just go over what is Spear V for for those that might not be aware. Um, Spear V is uh, the uh, intermediate representation uh, for shaders for, for Vulkan. It's a, bi it's a binary format. Um, Spear V is to Vulkan like as, as perhaps uh, DX bytecode is to, uh, to uh, DirectX. So maybe possibly a way to think about that and we'll see some other parallels actually as we uh, go over this. Um, so Spear V is, is a binary format. It's primarily, primarily generated um, from, uh, GL, from higher level uh, language shaders such as GLSL or HLSL. Um, uh, and and they, are, they are generated by using uh, several uh, different uh, uh, front ends. Um, GL, GL, GLSL or GL slang validator, um, uh, which is uh, uh, part of the GL slang uh, project, Kronos. Um, and uh, th that uh, front end has been around for a while and has just recently been adapted uh, to uh, parse HLSL as well. And that generates Spear V. And then uh, kind of new on the scene, uh, the, the DXC, uh, uh, front end. Uh, it's a Microsoft. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. It's a Microsoft uh, um, uh, for front end for HLSL uh, that's been recently fitted for uh, Spear V. Uh, Spear V also uh, has um, a disassembler and assembler, so you can disassemble, edit, reassemble if you wish. Uh, it has a validator to make sure you didn't make any mistakes when you uh, did uh, edit it. All right, so Spear V Opt. Um, this is a, a part of um, a project, Spear, the Spear V Tools project uh, in the Kronos group on GitHub. Um, it's a uh, collaboration uh, and it's, a, it's a, a monitored, uh, I can't think of the word now, but uh, there, it's essentially Google uh, kind of maintains it. Um, the work that I'm gonna talk about today is a collaboration um, between folks at Google uh, and uh, Lunar G with support from Valve uh, and uh, some other uh, additional uh, significant contributions from folks uh, in the, uh, involved with Mesa and, and uh, Roblox. Uh, basically, Spear V Opt is really just a collection of, of transformations, Spear V to Spear V transformations. Um, the ones uh, that 
I'm going to talk about today are specifically designed to reduce the size of um, either reduce the size of your Spear V shader or, um, or to legalize it. And I'll talk about what that means uh, in just a, a few minutes. Basically, uh, in, order, um, we, uh, to, in order to uh, reduce the size, well, all of these um, passes use, you are, uh, utilize kind of classic platform independent compiler optimization techniques. Um, if you've, um, that have been developed over the last um, 5, 10, 20 years. So, um, and uh, the, 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 the first set of these passes was first announced back uh, in August of last year at, at SIGGRAPH and uh, it, it generally been available since then. Um, and, and since then, actually, uh, there's been quite a, a bit of additional refactoring, improving uh, additions to it. So it's, it's a pretty active um, project right now. So reducing size. Um, when, when, I, when I first got involved with this, um, we were interested in um, reducing the size of, of Spear V. It was, um, as it was generated um, by uh, GL Slang Validator, um, it, it, it was, uh, like most front ends, it was, it was generating um, fairly raw, fairly ineffi you know, inefficient code, I guess you would say. Um, and so the idea was to apply a number of uh, classic optimizations to, um, to reduce its size. Uh, here's just a list of uh, 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 some of the more prominent ones. Um, if, if either these are designed to reduce, uh, to eliminate code from the, the shader, or it uh, does analysis or enables analysis to do additional uh, removal of code. Uh, recent measurements are showing us around now about 10% uh, um, uh, within 10% of DX byte code size. So we're we're pretty happy with that. Um, we we feel so we're fairly uh, close um, as as. Uh, um, for, for, for some uh, games with, with quite a number of shaders, uh, the, the, the original size of Spear V had been uh, fairly large and almost prohibitive in some cases. So the idea of getting these down to DX bytecode um, in, in, in that neighborhood was um, something that uh, was uh, considered desirable. Now, so the, now onto the, the, the term legalization. Uh, it sort of got coined uh, as part of uh, um, the, in, the, in the, last, the last few months. What we came across was that there were some constructs in HLSL that um, are not directly uh, supported by graphics hardware and, 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 were, and was not supported by Vulkan. So um, we... However, we determined that using standard uh, code transformation uh, techniques, we could uh, transform uh, the, uh, the shader code in, into a form that, did, that could be directly uh, executed on, on graphics uh, hardware. So, um, let's see. Uh, right, so, and, and this was, um, th this, this is not a problem that, that's peculiar only to Vulkan and to uh, the, our front ends. As a matter of fact, FXC, um, the, if, you, if you're from, likely you know everybody here in this room knows what FXC is. The Microsoft Shader Compiler also is a highly optimizing and transforming uh, compiler. And so uh, it, it basically does the same thing. And so, um, as, as a matter of fact, um, FXC actually, um, well, the, the current graphics hardwares, uh, hardware and drivers rely on the fact that uh, there are a number of optimizations and transformations that FXC performs before the shaders actually get to the driver. So, therefore, um, we, we also, in, in our... Um, ecosystem in our tool chain, we, we also then needed to do those same transformations in our optimizer, hence uh, in, uh, essentially in Spear V opt. 
So um, we are one, one of the kind of goals, ongoing goals, is to uh, get Spear V Opt to be equivalent to the optimization strength of X, FXC. I'm going to give a, just a couple examples of some uh, just uh, some structures uh, that that uh, um, in, in HLSL that do require um, um, transformation. Um, GL slang validator the um, will when it compiles HLSL if it finds one of these structures or one of these it will actually even evoke a message uh, saying that. Uh, legalization uh, is required. Um, these constructs, again, are, are optimized away through um, a, a uh, variations of uh, function call inlining, dead code, uh, dead flow elimination, um, value propagation, dead code elimination. Uh, one of the, so one of the structures is, um, when you, when, or one of the constructs, is, is uh, structures that contain opaque types, uh, sam uh, samplers, textures. Um, so here's an example of that. Uh, and, and this pattern is fairly um, we, um, you know, common in, in um, dif different shaders where uh, a, a, a sample sampler or, and or texture is assigned into a structure. That structure is passed um, maybe to a function call here. Uh, and then the sample is executed uh, using values out of the structure. Well, that's, um, so this, this, this structure is really not, um, uh, it's, it's not supported by Vulkan. It's considered, quote unquote, illegal by Vulkan, even though it's expressible in um, Spear V. So we needed to um, optimize this away. And so these values are propagated using standard compiler techniques and Voila, the red code's gone. And we, we end up with just a single sample operation at the point of the original call using the, uh, um, the, the actual texture and sample, sampler value. Another structure that um, we take care of in, in Spear V opt is uh, local structured buffers. Here's an example where, this is kind of a simplistic example, but it's, the pattern is uh, holds holds out uh, in in a, a number of shaders out in the wild, um, where you have a, a global um, structured buffer declared, but then inside of a function or inside of main, you've got a um, a, a local um, structured buffer that's declared and then assigned uh, the uh, and uh, the the value of the the global uh, buffer and then the local uh, object is referenced. So again, we use compiler techniques to transform that just into a, a reference of the global object. One last e example, and this is uh, of, of uh, using Spear V Op. This is not as much maybe a legalization as it is um, a way of, of um, avoiding uh, a, a validation layer errors uh, that we were seeing with a particular shader. Um, this, this, uh, in, these, in these shaders, um, we had uh, both, uh, we, we had dead uh, references to um, textures, samplers, uh, and, uh, and or buffers. And uh, uh, the, the, the calling uh, application knew that these were dead, and so they weren't binding these objects. However, the validation layer would throw an error. It would say, um, you've got these dead references to these objects, or, well, it would say, you have these references to these objects, um, but they're not bound by the outer um, application. So, um, however, after pre-processing the shader, uh, the, the um, Spear V Opt was able to uh, remove these uh, dead um, these dead uh, references. So here's just an example again. Um, again, a fairly simplistic example here. We've got both a live uh, texture sample using text zero and a dead uh, reference of text one. And, the op and uh, Spear V opt would remove the one. So 
how do you, um, so, so Spear V opt can be uh, called uh, directly if you, um, on a Spear V file. You, there is a command line option just to legalize for legalization of HLSL and, the, and those operations. It's also a, a, an optional, uh, an option to uh, optimize for size. And uh, we also have uh, the ability to, um, to call uh, individual passes and to specify the order and you can call them in any order that you wish. Uh, and, um, and, and those are all documented. Uh, and we also, uh, Spear B Opt also has an API interface and uh, it has methods then for, um, for calling the kind of a predetermined set of uh, legalization and, and size reduction passes. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, I think in, or in a previous talk, um, Spear Opt can also be uh, called uh, through the, uh, indirectly through the, the, the front end. So, um, however, one, and this is kind of one of the points of the talk, is that um, due to legacy reasons, uh, the, the GL slang validator uh, front end is, uh, uh, does, does not require Spear V tools and Spear V op to be linked in um, when, when you build it. So it's up to the user uh, to, to make sure that um, it's, it's linked in um, if, if they're indeed uh, compiling HLSL for Vulkan or at least uh, compiling any uh, such shaders that might have legalization issues. Um, if, if indeed Spear V tools is linked in with um, GL slang validator, uh, legalization will be called by default on HLSL um, shaders and uh, size optimization is available optionally. And uh, with the new DXC front end, um, which I think people will be talking about here just in a little bit, um, we, we do have default legalization and, and optimization already and those can be disabled. And also the GLSLC um, wrapper uh, for GL slang validator and Spear V tools also does legalization by default and uh, has an option for size reduction. All right, and the, some of the folks that have uh, contributed directly to Spear V opt or its integration with, um, with, uh, with the front end, so. Now I will uh, now in introduce Matthias. So thanks, Rick. Um, and I'm Matthias. I'm uh, the other side of support at AMD.com. If you send questions about Vulkan and the Shader Compiler. And I'm going to talk a bit about how to get from HLSL to Vulkan because that's the main thing we've seen when people are trying to port to Vulkan. They have like, huge code bases uh, in HLSL and they want to figure out how to run them. So let's get started. So where are we currently? So as I just said, huge HSL libraries and um, you want to use them with uh, Vulkan and Vulkan only accepts PV, right? There's no HSL path into it. Um, at the beginning, a couple of people have tried the macros way, so I just hash define everything and then pass it into GL slang, um, which I would certainly advise not to try like in practice for shipping games. Um, it becomes very unwieldy and there's no real reason why you should be doing this. It's more like a stopgap measure. The other thing is what a couple of people have tried is like you know, translate source to source. So you write your own HLSL parser and then you do magic. Um, it usually ends at the stage where you write your own HLSL parser. So, um, as I will testify, writing your HLSL parser is uh, quite some effort, so you shouldn't be doing this. Um, this also includes stuff where you translate like HSL bytecode into uh, GLSL and then try to compile it again and so on. That's just losing so much information along the way. And I'll be showing you a slide why you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so the thing I want to focus on are the two middle parts, right? So you. Uh, use, you have HLSL, a large code base, and you just use a compiler which natively accepts HLSL, which is GL slang or DXC. Um, and now you would all of you would hope, of course, um, okay, so I just 
replace like uh, copy GLS lang C to FXCX and then I just compile everything as usual and then be done and then my talk is over. But unfortunately, it's not quite that simple, but it's getting reasonably close at least. Um, so the problems are we have, a, uh, the main problem we have is actually a different binding model between D3, 11 and 12 and then to Vulkan again, right? So D3, 11, um, that's like slots and named bindings and D3, 12 has this root signature thingy um, and then it has descriptor heaps which are typed which Vulkan doesn't have and basically like what it boils down to is, um, so on the left hand side you can see like the HLSL way of doing things. So you have a root signature which links to descriptor heaps and that's like, that, that's the API side, so we have two levels of indirection on the API side, but on the shader side, you're only writing like register T0, and in the Vulkan world, you have two levels of indirection on the code side, because you have to set and binding thing, but at the same time, you only have one level of indirection on the API side. Um, and that's where all the nice, we just pretend everything is the same, basically starts falling apart, so we need to just like link both worlds somehow. And that's not the only problem we have, right? Um, so in GLSL versus HSL, we have uh, some resource types which don't really map. Um, sometimes it's just naming things which confuses people, like why is an image a UAV and why do I need a structured storage buffer for uh, things? Um, and some things have just no equivalent. So you can't have a read-only structured buffer because it's always read-writable from the API side. Um, at the same time, you can have it read only in the shader, and that's just making people's life unnecessarily hard because they want to map this the whole stack and they just have to like don't do it here but do it over there. Um, as we saw in the in Greg's talk the, about legalization, like some things are opaque objects you can't pass around, even for you can express it in SpearV. Once you try it, you will notice that it might work in certain circumstances when the compiler actually figures out it looks like FXC and I can just do it, but sometimes it just breaks. Um, bindless is very different, so I think I will be covering bindless uh, in a bit, mentioning it at least, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so that's going to be very, very different. I'm not going to cover it here because we, are, we have no only one hour of talking time. And as far as I can tell from experience with a couple of games so far, it's like the descriptor remapping is the main issue where People try to like subdivide ranges and do all of sorts of crazy stuff. So I'm not going to solve it here and I can't give you a solution which will work for all of your engines as much as I wish I would be able to. Um, it's about, the message I want to give you here is um, that's something you need to be aware, right? If you want to support both D3 and Vulkan or you're porting from D3 to Vulkan, that's the area where you need to like set aside some time, think through it, look how what works for your engine and that gets working. The good news is here, like all of the tools you need are in there because like everyone has his favorite binding way and all of them are supported by the tools by now. Um, and there is some stuff, if you only port HLSL, you will notice it's just missing in, in, in if you're just porting HLSL, you, you will notice that in Vulkan there is some functionality you can't access from HLSL at all, like push constants and input attachment and specialization constants and so on. Um, which require you to mark up your HLSL in a special way to be able to use those functionality. That's mostly interesting for those people who plan on shipping the same code base for um, some platform which is D3 based and some platform which is Vulkan based. And we have seen this in the practice, right? So people have like one HLSL code base, they still want to use those Vulkan specific features, so they need to mark it up somehow. And again, there's good news here. Um, we have extended HLSL in a way which makes it easy to integrate all of the special binding stuff you need for Vulkan without breaking HLSL completely. Um, in fact, the only problem you have with all of this stuff is you need to have a define which then just gets uh, no opt for FXC and things will just work. So you can have the same code, it's like all FXC code, uh, H all HLSL which FXC accepts and you only need to add stuff to make it like all working for Vulkan. There is no special, like you don't need to specialize twice, right? You only need to specialize, one, specialize once. So there's no if HLSL, blah, else if Vulkan, blah, and yeah. So that's the key point here, right? So all of your HLSL code base, like on day one, you can at least compile it for Vulkan. It will not exactly work because you have some stuff missing, but you can incrementally add all of this and you can take advantage of the new features. Um, and like, if from my point of view, that's going to be where you're going to spend the majority of your time when you try to actually port stuff over and it's like annotating these things. Usually you will want to like auto, like 
don't do this by hand, right? You will just have some tool which is, produces bindings and so on and so forth. Um, but again, the good news, everything is in place. This works today. The same syntax works on DXC and GLSlang. So you just type it in, you can run it, and it works, and there's like no magic required here. Spear view opt, yeah, so we've covered this before. I'm going to cover it again because it's such an important thing. Um, so my claim here will be, so if there's the one thing you take away from here, which is HLSL is awesome, and that's why Vulkan uses it. So the other thing you should be taking away is, if you have a compilation pipeline, it should be ending in spear view opt before you pass it into the driver. Um, it's, the one thing is it's required to be legal spear v anyway, so you have no much way around it. But at the same time, it does optimizations, and those optimizations which reduce the output size, so anything which makes your SPV smaller after you have run it through the optimizer, is generally a safe assumption that this will make your SPV run faster. And if it doesn't make your SPV run faster, it will at least make your compile time faster, so you will save time when the game loads up for the first time. So there is like no excuse to not use SPV op, right? You should be always using it. Um, there are some notes I would like to, the, Please prefer unroll and don't unroll yourself. Like, don't force unroll things. So we have seen horrible shaders coming in where it's like my SPV is two megabytes because I unroll all the things. Um, and turning on all options is also not a good idea. Like, we have seen some people who are just like SPV opt and then there's help and then it just dumps all the options and then we just grab that back in and then um, turns out not so much. Um, and the spear opt thing, you should also use it if you compile GSL, right? So there's no reason why you should only use it for HSL, you should only use it for GSL. Um, the net result is you will get usually significant savings in terms of like size of your shaders. So they should be in the ballpark of the bytecode. code. Um, there's no, there's, if, if that's not enough, you can compress it further. Um, there is domain specific compression tools available. The Aros is unfortunate in the GDC this year, but he's written a tool called smallv. Um, and that uh, solves the, like, one of the big, biggest issues with SPIRV where everything is 32-bit and all the identifiers are 32-bit even for your own use, like four bits out of them. Um, so that should get you on the shipping code base size roughly to D3D or below, um, hopefully. So if not, then we should probably work on this and talk to us, but it seems pretty okay. Like nobody has been complaining that they can't fit the shaders on a Blu-ray anymore. Um, which was the case when they started porting. Um, and performance, uh, everyone's favorite topic. So now we assume we have everything ported. Uh, our game is shipping. We have the download is done. We press the start game button, and then uh, everything just runs 10 times slower, um, which some developers used to call the Vulkan tags, because it's like once you have gone through all those layers of compilers and things have happened, and what came out at the end was not as performant as it used to be. Um, in particular, because GLSlang and uh, DXC compile in a very like literal way, this is my syntax tree and this is my output. And if you try to decompile your output, you will notice you can reconstruct your whole syntax tree. And if any one of you has ever compiled C++, this is not how like, optimizing compilers work. Um, so there's some stuff you still need to be on the lookout, but the major Vulkan text items are basically gone. Um, so the stuff where I would be on the lookout is the stuff where GLSlang and DXC tend to generate what I would call interesting code. Um, it's usually very easy to spot. So, any, so anything we're about around arrays, especially like temporal and local, uh, um, temporary arrays, local arrays, constant arrays, anything you would think that is like, this is getting a, like created once up front and then initialized might be actually created every time for every single loop iteration up front and then get initialized every single time you actually need it. So what happens is like in your innermost tightest loop, you're looking up array of 10 items and SPV will allocate a new one and then store 10 values into it every single time and then the loop unroller decides to unroll this and then you have a shader which is one million times like initializing an array because all of them are unique and different. Um, that's being improved a lot. It's just some things which have, like FXC never did this and the compilers have never seen this so they might sometimes get confused. Um, also function calls, like um, GLSL is still getting confused about function calls occasionally. If you pass in some structures, it will just give up on types, um, which is also getting rapidly better and like, it's not really a problem in practice anymore but there's still some stuff where the SPV has function calls when you compile it and 
If the compiler sees function calls, they might occasionally generate funky code because I don't think any one of you has used the D3D11 class linkage stuff and so on. Did anyone try over this? Okay. That's the only, only time FXC was generating function calls and a lot of crying was combined with this. Um, and also you have to be on the lookout when sometimes annotations don't get translated correctly. So you pass in like unroll and then after you have mangled it with three different compilers and four different optimizers, your unroll might have not made it through the final SPV. That's something you should be on the lookout. But overall I would say we are very, very close. Um, if the SPV is really slower, then you try the tools and you just try as many SPV opt options until it becomes fast enough. Um, if it doesn't, um, then I have more good news for you because we have tools you can actually inspect the whole pipeline through. Um, and here's some motivating screenshots. You can hopefully at least guess which tool this is. Does anyone know this tool? Okay, five out of 150. <laughs> That's, uh, Baldo will be very sad. Um, so this is RenderDoc, and uh, what you can probably only read from the first few rows is this is HLSL in RenderDoc in a Vulkan application. Um, the Vulkan application apparently is called Dota 2. And um, you can press a button here, and then you can see this POV. And then you press another button, and you can see like our intermediate presentation, and then you can see even ISA. And that should allow you to optimize shaders pretty quickly, or at least spot the worst offenders. Because you can see immediately, okay, I have HLSL, I have this POV, I have the ISA, and if they, they don't match or semantically, they become very different, and probably something is going on. And that's exactly the same comfort you have today in the uh, render doc with uh, HLSL and D3D. It's just HLSL in Vulkan. And that's also one of the reasons you shouldn't be like mangling your HLSL into something else and then getting it into Vulkan, because why? Here you can just pass an HLSL and just it's all the same, right? And even better, if you have the same game running on both D3D and Vulkan, you can just open up two copies next to, next to each other, and then you just go like, HLSL is the same, direct byte code versus POV, okay, they are similarities, and you go ISA, ISA is very different, and you give me a call. Or your other favorite IHV vendor. Um, so to sum this up, where are we? So games are shipping on Vulkan, and they have uh, HLSL source, so you can go on Steam, and you will find some applications which have Vulkan rendering based on HLSL. Um, single HSL source works, so you can keep all your HSL source, you don't have to rewrite it. And going forward, you will be able to use DXC to just like, ease the burden on all of this porting. And before I finish this, like, one thing I would encourage all of you to do is, now because you have SPV, you could consider using SPV as your internal company intermediate representation, because SPV is very valuable for this. You have high-level information in there. You have a stable code base, and it's a, it's a well-defined API. And you might consider just generating all your shaders and uh, store them as SPV internally or write tools around SPV, because I think that will enable a lot of people to just have more fun with shaders again, instead of being stuck with like this, I have my HLSL textual everything. And getting from SPV into other shading languages is actually pretty simple, right? So that might be something you would want to look at, right? So we only, we, most people just look at SPV as just something like, okay, I have this thing given by Kronos I need to use to get my shaders into Vulkan, but that's not it, right? You, you're getting a, a well-specified intermediate representation useful for other things, and I've seen at least a couple of people experimenting with, I compile my own stuff to SPV and have a lot of fun with it. Um, and that's it from my side, and um, next up is, hi. Thank you, Matthias. Um, all right, so we're going to take a look. Oh, sorry, let me introduce myself first. My name is Hai Wen. I uh, work with uh, David Netto on DXC, uh, on the Spear Egg project specifically. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the work that's been done on DXC and some of the things that uh, are applicable to workflows and some of the uh, uh, collaboration that we've been doing with uh, GL Slang. So let's get started. Sorry, I need to move a mouse out of the way here. Okay. So here is an overview of what we're going to chat about. Um, the first is just a brief history of um, how DXC got started. David covered a lot of this in his talk already, so I won't go into excruciating detail. The next part is uh, how we broke down the development process uh, into compilation, legalization, and optimizations. They just happen to coincide with how the, 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 the build process takes place. Uh, and after that, we're going to look at some of the uh, what's here now uh, and uh, like 
SM, 6.0, wave ops, semantics, reflection. Uh, and after that, we're gonna look at uh, what's coming. And lastly, um, DXC is uh, not a small project and it took a lot of community effort and I'd like to show some appreciation for all the uh, blood, sweat, and tears I've been through with this. Okay, so uh, the project was started in early 2017, um, initiated by Devin Netto. Uh, Google met with the, uh, the Microsoft DXC team and it was very positive. And so, the, you know, it's, I think we began coding pretty much immediately. Um, HLSL, HLSL has the recognition of being a language without a spec. Um, and it, it's even, you know, it's, it's cunning enough to uh, get past the, even the experts. And I was talking to Baldor uh, recently and I, I was asking him about the, the usage of the uniform keyword and when I gave him the example, <laughs> the first response I got back was, I did not know that was legal. Um, and so Microsoft plans to uh, evolve HLSO rapidly once DXC is stable. And this, of course, presents a particularly interesting challenge for us uh, if we wanted to keep up. So when you can't keep up, just join them. So leverage the front-end parser. Um, and so that brings us to where we are today. Um, SpearEgg at Google um, uh, contributes and maintains the SpearV backend for DXC. It's open source under the LLVM license and it's hosted on GitHub. Um, SpearEgg also leans on, uh, or initially leaned a lot on GL Slang's progress to get started. Uh, in the early days, the, the code gen was identical to, um, to GL Slang, and as we progressed, uh, things began to diverge a little bit, um, but they both generate code that work. Um, and uh, these days, both projects uh, work uh, in collaboration to maintain parity between uh, the HLSL functionality. Um, SpearEgg also works very closely with the SpearV tools team. In fact, they sit right next to each other. Uh, and DXC Spear V leans heavily on uh, Spear V Opt for optimization and legalization. Uh, we also do a, uh, a fair bit of outreach to the community um, and to the IHVs. Um, some of them may not like me right now um, uh, <laughs> to get feedback on how to shape DXC going forward because ultimately we want this to be a very successful product for uh, the Vulcan ecosystem. So in the, in the development, um, we, we broke down uh, how we wanted to achieve getting to the, the end product, what will look like the 1.0 product for DXC Spear Egg. Um, we started out by breaking into three high-level goals, um, um, compilation, legalization, and optimization. Uh, compilation is um, the parsing of HLSL to the generalized Spear V. Uh, we call this the front-end process, and it happens within the DXC code base. Uh, next up is legalization, and it's the transforming of uh, generalized Spear V to the Vulcan dialect. We refer to this as the back-end process. Um, and Greg's talk went into a lot of detail about this, so I'll skip over that. Uh, and lastly, optimization is also a back-end process. It transforms the, the Vulcan Spear V to be more performant. Uh, and as Matthias uh, alluded to, there are some controversial transforms like loop unrolling. Um, we've been having this kind of into this debate between ISVs and IHVs about uh, uh, if this is, is uh, productive or not. So we're gonna settle the score once and for all at SIGGRAPH 2018. Um, so come there to see some benchmarks. Um, so SpearEgg has been really busy. Um, Lei Chang and Asan Nasiri are the two main contributors to uh, uh, SpearEgg. Uh, as you notice, they're the one and three, <laughs> first and third major contributors to the DXC project. Um, so, to just kind of pull the curtain back a little bit about legalization, we are aware that uh, there are some generated SPV that is problematic for consumption. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the complex HLSL opaque object referencing. Um, the, there's, it's structs containing structs containing structs containing more structs that contain opaque objects. Uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, I've seen the production code, and I'm sure you've seen the production code that does this. Um, so. We are aware of these things, and um, this is the first time legalization has been attempted for HLSL and Vulcan, so we've learned a lot of valuable lessons, and we're working with the IHVs to address this as quickly as possible, um, and these, these, these fixes will come, uh, or the resolution will come in bug fixes to DXC as well as uh, driver updates. Okay, um, going on to a little bit more positive things. Um, so what's here today? So we have uh, full SM 5.1 support. Um, bugs and features that Vulkan can't support notwithstanding. If you do find a bug in anything related to SM5, SM51, please report on the GitHub. Um, and if we're missing anything, I know that ROVs are missing right now, but uh, there's not a direct way to address that in Vulkan, um, so we're still working on that. Um, SM60 uh, wave ops came in with uh, Vulkan 1.1. 1 
Um, sorry, I uh, forgot to delete a <laughs> note there. Um, some other highlights of, uh, of DXC uh, that, made, that have made it into DXC recently. Uh, global variables are now collected under the global C buffer, and these are variables that, you, that are externally visible and are of uh, simple types like int or float2 or matrix, uh, not any of the opaque objects. Uh, we've also been experimenting with what it looks like to get uh, extensions in HLSL from the DXC side, and we implemented um, SPV KHR draw shader parameters as a, a, um, as a first version of this, and there's a bit of magic that's happening in here. You know, when you use the IDs from this, it automatically detects it and then inserts the, um, inserts the extension. Um, the two most exciting things that have happened in our little local team is that we've got semantics and counter buffers in as an extension, and we'll talk about it in just a little, in just a little bit. Um, and uh, we're adding the Vulkan extension, or we'll be pro proposing the Vulkan extension soon to support this uh, on the driver's side. And lastly, uh, we've been doing a little bit of work with reflection because there's been a lot of community feedback about reflection and we wanted to provide a lighter um, path for reflection. Um, so let's take a look at semantics and counter buffers. So we, um, the Dixie team along with GL Slang worked on two extensions um, to make this happen. The, in order to decorate for semantics, we needed a, a decoration or we needed an opcode that permitted a decoration to a variable or to a struct member that could carry a string. And so op decorate string Google and op member decorate string Google um, were added. And um, once we had those, we could uh, add decorations, themse the decorations themselves. Uh, the first one we added was uh, HLSL semantic. It's, sorry, it's, in, it's out of order here. Um, and this leverages uh, the previous extension to add the string decoration to a variable or a struct member um, for the semantic that looks, that is defined in the HSL source. And the other one is, uh, this has been a problem for quite a while and there's been a lot of workarounds, but there is a decoration that explicitly links the, a structured buffer with the counter buffer that is associated with it. And this is a hard link. You don't have to go and parse the uh, name of the variable anymore with at count. Um, the Vulkan extension is in progress. Um, both of these are opt-in features for um, the compilers. To opt-in for DXC, you do dash F uh, SPV reflect and to um, opt in for GL slang, uh, you do dash HSL functionality one. Um, I believe GLSLC supports dash HSL functionality one too, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow. okay, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so here's, the, here's a bit of the semantics and counter buffers in action. On the uh, left side is the source code and you can see my workflow there. Um, and this is what it looks like in the Spear V. So it's, it's working, it's there. There is, however, one slight catch to this. Um, because the drivers uh, can't consume the opcodes and decorations yet, they need to be stripped before they get fed to the driver. Um, but uh, we thought about this and what uh, we're gonna do is we'll provide a code snippet that you can use. It's about 20 lines of code that um, Lei Chang wrote and it'll take out all the, um, all the, the opcodes for the decorations for uh, semantics and counter buffers, and you can pass the spear read clean to the driver. Um, and um, this will, this code will appear in the spear read reflect repo. All right, so what is spear read reflect? Spear read reflect is a small C, C++ library. It's two headers, or sorry, two files, one header, one source. Um, Court Stratton and myself have been working on it. Um, when you, if you start using it, send all bugs and request to court. That's what it looks like. It's right over there. Um, and this is the data that it reflects, uh, vertex attribute locations, um, basic type information that shows you with that. Um, Court pointed out recently that it, it only assu assumes everything is 32-bit, so if you're trying to build a vertex input from that, you need to make sure that you correct it for whatever format that you're using. Um, it does a pretty extensive uh, reflection of descriptor bindings and sets, uh, uniform storage, co push constant blocks, uh, relative offsets, absolute offsets, raw size, et cetera. Uh, and it also does the HLSL resource types. So there's literally a, an ID field in the struct that tells you if it's a CBV, SRV, UAV, or sampler. And we went through a lot of pain to make this happen because it's not obvious how to derive that from the Spear V. And of course, uh, it will contain semantics and counter buffers. Uh, so here's what the, here's an example of the reflection looks like uh, from our test harness. As you can see, it's parsing through um, pretty much everything that uh, this 
cbuffer.spv contains. Um, so one little note, it says source language unknown here. We just merged the <laughs> pull request to add the lang language version to uh, DXC. It's a little embarrassing, I apologize. Uh, and here's the, a more crazy version of uh, a test harness that uh, does all the SRV, UAV, et cetera. Uh, one of the ones that was kind of controversial in this one was the, um, the, the one, that, or the one that people can't seem to get correctly is the, the storage versus textile buffer. These are actually images, um, and they kept on getting parsed as buffers. And so this will go live at this, at my, on my personal GitHub repo. Um, it'll go live on uh, the 23rd. And um, if you find any issues, please follow them on uh, GitHub and Court will get to them. Court also loves issues, and this is what he looks like again. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, his, that's his Twitter pick, by the way. So, you know, you, you have references. Uh, and we're working, um, we're working to get this into Spear V tools, and when it does go into Spear V tools, Spear Reflect will likely get deprecated. So um, here's a few things that are coming soon um, that uh, I think are uh, pretty exciting. The first up is uh, descriptor indexing, and this will enable bindless on Vulkan, and it will, it will also enable non-uniform resource index. Um, I hope you're excited about this feature because everybody I talk to about HL, this is the first thing they ask, um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it just to not get asked about it anymore. Um, the, the IHVs have confirmed that they are supporting this, but we don't have a date on it, so it's coming soon. Um, extension support into, um, into DXC. It will likely come as a command line option. It'll be dash uh, F SPV extension equals extension A, and then the same thing, extension B, et cetera. Uh, it's just keeping conformance with the, the, Clang, um, uh, the Clang format. And of course, more things for shader model six, 64-bit um, integers, 16-bit scalars, um, very centrics. Uh, and here's a few things that uh, we have talked about and debated internally and argued about, but we haven't come to any firm conclusions yet, uh, and, but people have asked for them. Uh, the first one is um, inline uh, C buffer initialization. Um, this, is, uh, this is a little bit difficult to do because we have to package data in the, in the Spear V file itself. Um, so we're still, we're still talking about that. You might see an extension called HSL functionality two or three that adds this. Uh, and I'm sorry, this, is, this was supposed to be root signatures, um, not root descriptors. Um, I've just been thinking about root descriptors a lot lately. Uh, so uh, one of the features that DX12 has is that you can, you can slam a root signature directly into the HL cell source, uh, and this has been raised several times. Um, so we want to get, uh, we want to try to explore what this means. And also GL slang has this, or sorry, GLSL has this nice ability for, uh, for you to specify a uh, extension inside the source itself. We've been thinking about that too. It'll probably come in the form of a syntax that looks similar to how you specify the, vi the bindings currently. Um, before I, I wrap up, um, I want to say one last thing. Um, if you are using DXC and you have a pretty extensive code base, we are aware that some of the legalization can take a little bit of a long time. Um, there's a man in the audience here that is, that is the, that's heading up this, uh, solving this particular problem. Um, I won't embarrass him. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. um, and DXC is, is by no means a small project, and it, is, it took a lot of people to, to get DXC to where it is today. Um, and, and we still have a long ways to go, but it, it's a community effort, and it really shows, um, it really shows uh, you know, how, much the, how much interest there is in Vulcan. And you know, when, when, when Vulcan moves forward, everybody moves forward. Um, so the DXC team itself uh, is myself and Lei Chang and uh, Aslan Desiri at Google, and David heads it up. Um, the guidance is David Netto and John Kesnich. Um, every time we get into a debate that we can't solve, we email John or David, um, sometimes very late at night. Um, Spear Reopt, uh, Greg Fisher, uh, Diego Novillo, um, Steve Perrin, and Alan Baker have uh, been working hard to getting all the legalization and performance optimizations in. And we have a lot of our friends from the IHVs that we bother pretty much constantly about getting things done um, or getting our stuff corrected for their driver. Um, and uh, the Kronos members that, that have really uh, helped push this effort forward. Um, the legalization stuff uh, actually started as a conversation between Dan Ginsburg and myself uh, on pretty much the first time we met. Uh, and then that kicked off the entire workflow of how, the, uh, how I got started. 
Um, and uh, Neil Henning has provided a lot of um, a lot of uh, input onto uh, Spear V, uh, how Spear V is restructured in the code gen. Uh, and Tobias uh, Hector has given us a lot of feedback on uh, how things should flow in, in Vulkan itself uh, when Spear V is executed. Uh, and Dan Baker, uh, I'm not sure if he's here today, but Dan Baker was one of the original authors of FXC, and he's had to put up with a lot of uh, direct conversations about why did you do this? <laughs> Uh, and here's the list of uh, companies that have contributed to this, to the to progress of this work. Um, and so at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Matthias and Greg Fisher back up for any questions the audience may have. question, I'm just going to start reading Spear Opcodes codes to you. All right. Greg, uh, Greg, during your talk, uh, you mentioned that uh, GL Slang Validator did not um, uh, require inclusion of uh, Spear V tools. But uh, now what if I use the GL Slang Validator from the Lunar G Vulcan SDK? Greg, you can take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, happily, um, if you use GL Slang Validator out of the Lunar G Vulcan SDK, it does have Spear V tools linked in, and so legalization will be done uh, by default. And, and please use the ones from the SDK because then we have the version number and we don't have to compile it ourselves. Uh, yeah, one question. You said that you are going to have like similar optimizations than DX. C, but DXC has a lot of stupid optimizations as well, like from the old VEC4 architectures in DirectX 11 era, that, that it does some extra optimizations because that was fast back then, but it's not anymore with scalar, scalar architectures. Are you going to just ignore those things or like the legacy stuff that is on the DXT, DXC? Sure, I can take it. Um, so you might be surprised, but we actually talk with those guys here, and if they do stuff which is completely stupid, and we tell them about it and ask them to not do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, for a friendlier version of the answer, <laughs> um, we, we are quite aware of some of the differences uh, of how FXC structured the optimizations versus how we have to structure the optimizations these days. Um, and we are at a, diff a slightly different place um, because of how DXC is choosing to, or how, how DXC DXIL is choosing to go about optimization. Um, and you know, we, we, want to, we want to optimize for things that make sense on modern hardware and going, going back as, as far as it makes sense. Um, but we don't have any recipes, we haven't settled any particular recipes right now. Um, and when we do, we'll document them. Yeah, I was actually talking about the older FXC that is still used in most projects, and uh, the newer one might might be better than this, obviously. I mean, so, so the good news is uh, not, none of those optimizations which would make things worse have gone on in yet, and I don't expect this to happen, actually. Okay, that's, that's nice to hear. So you don't need to, like, <laughs> revert those optimizations in drivers anymore. Take one more. Okay, this assumes that everybody is uh, all right with HLSL and is happy with it. <laughs> You're done. Yay. Awesome. Well, well, thank you, everybody. It's uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys.